this scripture before we worship and sing together. Among the gods, there is none like you, Lord. No deeds can compare with yours. All the nations you have made will come and worship before you, Lord. They will bring glory to your name. For you are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. Let's worship this God today. Sing with us. Water you turn into wine. response to these things. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Let's sing it out. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what can stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? Would you sing it, ladies? Oh, 
voice. Sing it to the Lord. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. to the Lamb of God. Would you please be seated?
Jesus called us to be his witnesses in Nashville, in Tennessee, in the United States, and around the world. Whether it's in the MDU at Mill Creek or the slums of Rio, whether it's in Rogersville sharing Christmas with children or on the baseball fields in Nepal, it's never been either or, it's and and both. He has called us to be on mission with him. And what does that mean? It means me being involved, sharing the good news of the gospel, serving others nonstop. That's what God has called us to do. As we come to this time of prayer this morning, ask God to open our hearts and our minds, not to say where or if, but to say when and how. So as we come to this time of prayer this morning, Brother Mike will be coming and others will be coming to pray for him. You may have needs in your life that you need prayer. The altars are open. Come where you are, where you're sitting. Pray there. However you choose to do so, let's spend some time in prayer before the good, good Father this morning. privilege it is this morning to come to you in prayer, the very God that scooped out the valleys, made the hills, created us, Father, is now listening to the voices of his children. And Father, we pray that our hearts might be burdened for the lost, that our hearts might see the world as you see the world, Father. And as that voice rang out many, many years ago, who will go, who will tell? that one small voice, here am I, Lord, send me. Might that be what you hear this morning over this congregation, Father? Here am I, send me, wherever, whenever, however. Father, I lift up our pastor to you this morning as he preaches and brings the word. Father, we ask that hearts might be opened, ears might listen, Father, and then we might act in faith on what we've heard this morning. God, we love you, and we thank you for this time that you've brought us together to reinforce, to encourage, and lift us to, to new knowledge of you. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, and it's great to be in worship this morning and uh, to celebrate a baptism. And so this morning, I stand in the water with Gibson Scott. And Gibson, uh, back last summer during Vacation Bible School, uh, during the middle of the week, um, marked on a card that we asked the kids to fill out that he wanted to become a Christian and to kind of walk through that process a little bit. And so uh, that day he sat down with one of our VBS counselors in the hallway and they walked through those steps and, and Gibson became a Christian at Vacation Bible School this past summer. And so we're so excited for that. He went home or actually that day told his mom about it and just the emotions of that came through and she was so excited and they began to walk the process at home and talk about that, what it means. We went through the new Christians class and then I met with him uh, uh, just a few months ago and just kind of walked through what baptism was really all about. And so this morning he wanted to come and just tell you what God had done in his life. And so Gibson, I ask you, have you asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior? When it's my honor and my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, very likeness of his death, raised to walk in a new life.
Good morning, church. My name is Gene Tortai, and I served as the chair of your board of trustees in 2016, and I'm honored to serve in that role again in 2017. There are many stories we could share about what God is doing, but today we want to tell you a story you may not have heard before. It's a story of our partnership with Mill Creek Baptist Church. When you think of the Middle Tennessee Initiative, you might think about our regional campuses or our efforts to address needs in the areas of poverty, education, and health care. While those are significant aspects of MTI, one area you may not know about is our effort to partner with and support other churches in Middle Tennessee, like Mill Creek Baptist Church. God is up to something in Middle Tennessee, and we're excited to work closely with other churches to join Him in His work and reach our communities with the gospel. Mill Creek Baptist Church is a very historic church here in Middle Tennessee. The original Mill Creek was established in 1797 and is regarded as the mother church of Southern Baptist churches here in Middle Tennessee because it planted many of the churches that have gone on to plant other churches. And so Mill Creek has a legacy of being a church that God uses to not just impact the people inside the building but impact all of Middle Tennessee and so it's been my prayers that God would restore this church to being that powerful instrument that he'll use to again advance his kingdom here in Middle Tennessee and to the ends of the earth. One of the reasons that Brentwood Baptist and Mill Creek have connected so well is that we have a similar vision and we have seen God work at Mill Creek. They want their congregation to grow and be healthy, absolutely. But they want more than that. They want to be a forward operating base out of which the gospel goes out from their church building into communities and into homes all around that area. Mill Creek Baptist Church is located in a very strategic location because it's located right in the heart of the International Corridor. And we have a unique opportunity to do ministry to an, a very diverse population. One of the areas that Brentwood has helped us with in that respect is to help supply the technology we need to translate our sermons into other languages. Lots of churches that we work with, our aim is to help them get on their feet and to become healthy. And so Mill Creek is a great example of that. They said, could you bring your medical dental unit? And out of that, a young man named Ariel came and not only received some free dental care, but he accepted Christ, and he's become a part of that community and that congregation. I grew up in gangs. I used to be out in the streets a lot. You know, I've been, I've been shot so many times, I never a bullet, a bullet touched me. He brought me here. He pulled me, like, in mysterious ways, like, I just all of a sudden came here to do a dental cleaning and it didn't even happen, but I, I got baptized the next day out of that. One of the great parts of the story is that Ariel is now our lead person when it comes to translation. So he came in through MDU, he's been a part of the church, become a member of the church, and now he is off to the side of me listening to what I'm saying and now Ariel's got the headset on and he's speaking my words into Spanish so that our Spanish speakers, as, as God is bringing them to us, can hear and understand God's message in their own language. When I'm reading what, uh, the whole sermon and when I translate it, it helps me think that everything in the Bible is true. And when I transmit the message, I just, I don't know, it's something about transmitting it that, you know, like that love that, that I don't know how to explain it. It's, it's, it's something special. When we partner together, it's a real partnership. It's, it's something where we can help a bigger group and the bigger group can help us that we work together to advance God's kingdom. Mill Creek is central to our MTI efforts because we will never contain the gospel just in one area. But this is our home. And this is a focus. We get to be part of this river of God who brings the light to God's creation. Middle Tennessee Initiative and Mill Creek 
blessing the nations, blessing Middle Tennessee. When you came in, you were given a copy of the annual report, and as uh, you peruse it this week, I hope you do take the time to read through this, and you'll see more about the story of Mill Creek and the other work that we're involved in throughout the Middle Tennessee Initiative and around the world. Um, I want you to read it with, with three, three things in mind. One, I want you to read it, and I want you to celebrate, and I want you to praise God for what happened in 2016. Uh, there's a lot of times in our life when good things are going on all around us and we just do not take the time to celebrate them, recognize them, or, or give thanks to God for what's happening. Uh, we deal with a lot of churches, we, we travel, we, we talk to other staffs, we, we kind of try to keep our pulse on what's going on. And really, what's going on here through the campuses of Brentwood Baptist Church isn't being repeated very often across the United States. And you need to know that and understand that and understand why God has given us a lot of responsibility and a lot of opportunity. He is doing good things, keeping lots of promises in our midst, and you and I need to be sure that we celebrate and give thanks for that. The second thing I want you to do is, is I want you to read through this and look at all the variety of people who are engaged. Uh, all kinds of people are needed to make this thing happen. That means you have a place. So if there's a story that uh, gets you curious about something, is there something that gets you passionate about something, you read through here and find a way for you to, to get connected in a meaningful way in what God is doing in and through the campuses of Brentwood Baptist Church. Lastly, know that we cannot do any of this without your faithfulness to this moment. Uh, because of your generosity, because of your obedience to the teachings of our Lord about giving, we're able to respond when God opens the door. We're able to move if, when we see the opportunity. We have the resources we need. And all of that happens because of your faithfulness in this moment. So if you've joined us in Overflow at Baskin Chapel, we welcome you. And there you'll have the ushers coming to serve you as the ushers are now coming to uh, receive the gifts of the people here in the main sanctuary. So let's continue our worship through our giving and let's pray together. Receive the gifts of your children, for we give them with great enthusiasm and excitement, celebrating all you have done in the history of Brentwood Baptist Church, eager to see what you will yet do. And for this, we offer all that we are and all that we have, so there's not a man, not a woman, not a child who doesn't know the good news of your son, in whose name we now pray. Amen. God? Well, that's kind of the $60,000 question, isn't it? If we could answer that one, we can all kind of go home early. Ultimately, Jesus says, everything worth finding, we find in our relationship with God. God is Father. God is Shepherd. God is Warrior. He is, as one famous theologian said, the Holy Other. Funny thing about this, you can spend the rest of your life answering this question, but this is the one adventure that is ultimately and completely worth it. Isaiah chapter 40 is an incredible chapter. After all the descriptions of God in chapter 40, he closes it by saying, but those who trust in the Lord shall soar on wings like eagles, shall run and not grow faint, shall walk and not grow weary. And for Isaiah, it was a mind-blowing reality that when you trust in the Lord, not only is your strength renewed when you're soaring, but your strength is renewed when you're walking. When we need to experience the presence and power of God most is in those everyday, every moment, small details of even walking. Our God is majestic beyond our imagination, but our God is intimate and renews us even when we're walking. So there's an old preacher saying, you become what you behold. In other words, the image that you have of God in your mind is what eventually you will strive towards. And so if you think about it, have we created an image of God that's more in the image of us? Or do we allow his revealed truth to shape what we understand of his character and his nature and his ways? All of scripture is a testimony to how sovereign, 
how awesome and how eternal our God truly is. And yet at the same time, the Bible teaches us that our God is not just transcendent and far off, but that he also is near, that he's imminent, that he cares about us and the unique details of our lives. It's that awesome thought that our creator, most high God, knows and cares about each one of us deeply that we're going to explore together today. My mother-in-law, Wildred Powers, loves the English language. She studies words. She loves the way words work. She is a voracious reader. And so you can imagine that doing what I do, we've had some uh, conversations about the English language, about what word works best and, and how you use this word, how you pronounce this word correctly, and on and on the discussion goes. One time we had such a discussion while we were washing dishes. She was washing dishes and I was drying and in the middle of this process, she points up to a tea pitcher, which is on the top shelf of the cabinet. She says, can you reach that? I look up, I look back at her, yes. <laughs> then I go back and dry the dishes. She keeps looking at me and I don't say anything else. Michael, can you reach that pitcher? Yes. <laughs> and then I keep drying dishes. She keeps staring at me and I keep looking back at her. Finally, she realizes what she's done and she slaps me on my arm and goes, will you reach me that picture? <laughs> oh, different question. The first was information. Am I able to do that? Yes, I've done the math. I think my arm will extend that high. Yes, I can do that. Oh, you want me to? Oh, okay. Different question. Can you? Do you have the ability? Will you? Do you have the desire? Honestly, that's a question we, la we ask a lot to God. Can you do something? Will you do something? And while we debate on whether or not we can trust God to do, our, to do what is best for us, to have the desire to help us, I'm not so sure that sometimes he doesn't ask us the same question. Can you? Will you? Talking about God is a huge topic. I'm glad we have the writers of Scripture that can kind of give us the guardrails, kind of fence off the playground that we can play in. And today we're going to read parts of Isaiah 40 that will help guide our thoughts on this topic. Stand with me in honor of God's Word. Zion, herald of good news, go up on a high mountain. Jerusalem, herald of good news, raise your voice loudly. Raise it and do not be afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See, the Lord God comes with strength and his power establishes his rule. He re his reward is with him and gifts accompany him. He protects his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lamb in his arms and carries them in the folds of his garment. He gently leads those that are nursing. Now who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand or marked the heavens with a span of his hand? Who has gathered the dust of the earth in a measure or weighed the mountains in a balance or the hills and the scales? Who has directed the spirit of the Lord or who has given him counsel? Who did he consult with and who gave him understanding and taught him the paths of justice? Who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Look, the nations are like a drop in the bucket. They are considered as a speck of dust on the scales. He lifts up the islands like fine dust. Lebanon is not enough for the fuel or animals enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are considered by him as nothing, as emptiness. So who will, God, who will you compare God with? What likeness will you compare him to? To an idol? Something that a smelter casts, a metal worker plates with gold and makes silver welds for it? This one who shakes a pedestal, choosing wood that, do, that does not rot. He looks for a skilled craftsman to set up an idol that will not fall over. 
Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been declared from the beginning? Have you not considered the foundations of the earth? God is enthroned above the circle of the earth. Its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a thin cloth. He spreads them out like a tent to live in. He reduces princes to nothing, makes judges of the earth irrational. They are barely planted, barely sown. Their stem hardly takes root in the ground when he blows on them and they wither. The whirlwind comes and carries them away like stubble. Who will you compare me to or who is my equal? Ask the Holy One. Look up and see who created these, who brings, the story, who brings out the story host by number, who calls them by name. Because of his great power and strength, not one of them is missing. Jacob, why do you say, and Israel, why do you assert that my way is hidden from the Lord and my claim is ignored by God? Do you not know? Have you not heard? Yahweh is the everlasting God, the creator of the whole earth. He never grows faint or weary. There is no limit to his understanding. He gives strength to the weary. He strengthens the powerless. Now youth may faint and grow weary. Young men, they stumble and fall. But those who trust in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Those who trust in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. This is God's word for God's people. Hear it, believe it, and live. Let's pray together. To know you is an impossible endeavor. And it is not arrogance that drives us here. We do not think we can box you in. We do not think we can contain you. Contain you. We don't think we can understand you. But we know if we can just get a little piece, a little bit more, that just any piece of you will transform our minds and heal our hearts. If we can walk out of here with just a little bit more, that's all we want. We beg this from you, and it is in your name we pray. Amen. Sometimes the planning of the sermon is more fun than the actual delivery of it. And when we started planning this series about a year ago, and we were talking to the discipleship team and said, hey, we want to spend some time on the foundational doctrines, the basic truths of the gospel. Uh, can we have a sermon series on that? Yes, that's great. So we put it all up on the board and we said, hey, we need to have one sermon where we talk about God. That'd be a good thing to do. And then the week comes and you grab the folder and you open it up and the topic is, who is God? And if you can wrap it up by 1030, we'd appreciate it. <laughs> what were we thinking? I don't know, but we'll give it our best shot. And we're going to use the words of Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40 is a transitional chapter in the book of Isaiah. If you're reading straight through Isaiah, you will notice an abrupt and drastic change between chapters 39 and chapters 40 uh, and, and on. In fact, so much of a change, so much change in wording, uh, the cultural setting, uh, the physical setting, the, the, the point of view of the writer and the, and the point to be made in the writing, all of this is drastically different. So much so that a lot of scholars have divided Isaiah into 1st Isaiah, chapters 1 through 39, and 2nd Isaiah, chapters 40 through 66. Some of the most beautiful writing in the history of the world, some of the most theologically deep, passionate writing about God's salvation is in the part that we call 2nd Isaiah, chapter 40 through 66. The suffering servant passages, uh, by his stripes we are healed. That is in this passage of Scripture. One of the reasons we think that, that it's kind of a different setting is that we're no longer in Jerusalem. We're no longer worried about Assyria. Now we are in Babylon. And this is the end of the Babylonian captivity, the, the anticipation that maybe we'll get to go home. Now Babylon had an interesting way of dealing with its conquered people. 
uh, you will remember from the story of Daniel and his friends that Babylon would overtake an area, and when Nebuchadnezzar overtook an area, they would take the best and brightest of that city, of that country, and they would move them back to Babylon. And they would train them in the laws of Babylon, in the culture of Babylon, in the religion of Babylon, uh, and, and, they, and make them thoroughly Babylonian. And then they would send them back to serve as governors, as, as bureaucrats, and that kind of thing. But they would be thoroughly Babylon, Babylonian when they came back. So you have the best and brightest of Jerusalem gone. It doesn't leave a whole lot. And so Jerusalem falls into a ghetto. Uh, the walls are breaking down. The, the gates have fallen off their hinges. Uh, raiders come and rob the place regularly. It's, it's, we almost lose Jerusalem to history during this time. Uh, this is right before Nehemiah goes to the king and, and is asked by the king, why do you look so downcast? And Nehemiah takes that opportunity to talk about Jerusalem, and Nehemiah is given the authority to go back to Jerusalem and, and rebuild it. Uh, this is before that happens. Right now, we're in Babylon. We have done what Jeremiah said. Remember in Jeremiah, in his letter to the captives, he said, build houses and live in them. Have families, teach them, grow them up. Plant gardens and eat of their harvest. They had made a life in Babylon. Uh, no, it was not what they had wanted, but it was the life they had, and they were doing okay. But they had just about given up hope of ever going back to Jerusalem. And now the prophet comes and says, the time of your punishment is over. You have paid for the sins that Jeremiah warned you about. You have paid for those sins, and now God is going to take you home. You're going back to Jerusalem. And I'm sure on the one hand, that was great news. Yay, we're going to go back home. And the next was despair. How are we going to do that? What's going to happen? Is the king going to wake up and suddenly change his mind? And if we go back, how do we rebuild? We don't have the money. We don't have the resources. We don't have the people. We don't have an army. What are we going to do? How does this work? Can God do anything about the situation that we're in? Do you not know? Have you not heard? You see, sometimes you go to church, just like these people went to synagogue, and you hear the great truths of Scripture, and you think they don't matter to where you are. You don't take the time to think through, what does this mean for where I live? Remember, the last promise is that you will walk and not grow faint. That you'll be able to take every day as it comes and put one foot in front of the other and it won't overwhelm you. Okay, that's the last promise. Now, how do we get to from, okay, we're in Babylon, you're telling us we're going to go home. We can't see a way in the world that's going to happen to the fact that we can walk and not pass out. First of all, have you not heard, do you not know that the God you serve, the God who now makes this promise, is the God who made everything? So when we celebrate creation and our God, the maker of creation, you don't think that that has anything to do with the power God might need to handle your situation. This is a God who knows every star by name called it out into being. And because he was so good at it, so powerful at getting it done, he didn't lose one star. Now, you would think out of a couple of billions, if he goofed on one or two, it wouldn't upset him. Right? If you go see a famous, uh, the house of a famous artist and you go in their studio, uh, you will see half-done paintings, hundreds of them. There'll be sketches and drawings, and you'll start to see the color of a famous masterpiece. You'll start to see the layout of a, of a, uh, of a famous masterpiece, okay? But you'll see lots and lots of do-overs, goofs, okay? See, the problem with thinking about God and creation is you think God works like you do, like I do, okay? You think there's something in common. Isaiah wants you to know you've got nothing in common with God. 
Nothing, okay? You go to make something, I go to make something. You paint, you hammer, you saw, you put it up, you look at it, you step back and you go, meh, close enough. Right? Genesis 1 does not say that Jesus looked at, that God looked at creation and said, close enough. No, he said it's good. It came through his mind, this is what I want, and what he wanted came into being. He did not look at you and say, eh, close enough. Okay? If you were able to work into God's workroom, his storeroom, you would not see a lot of goofed up models of you. Yeah, I was working hard on you. This was, the, you wouldn't see that. God has the power to make happen what he thinks should happen, what he says will happen. Creation is the first evidence of that. Okay? The second evidence is he commands the power. The power doesn't command him. Okay? Princes are as nothing. Pagan kings do the will of God because God tells them to do it. Now, I know we're all, we're all a flutter right now in the United States about, about the president and who his counselors are and who his powers are and da-da-da-da-da-da, who's in Russia, who's in here, da 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 God controls it all. Okay? You need to remember that. Have you not heard? Do you not know? Don't you love how he says that? Have you not heard? Yeah, we hear that. Do you know it? No. Because if you knew it, you would act differently. You would live differently if you knew your God was that big. You remember when Moses stood in front of Pharaoh? Remember that story? He stands in front of Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the world, with the biggest army the world had ever known at that time. And he says, God sent me to tell you to let my people go. Now, you do know that with the raise of a finger, the turn of an eyebrow, that Pharaoh could have had Moses executed on the spot and nobody would have said nothing. This is over. What made Moses do that? Simple. He was more afraid of God than he was Pharaoh. Now, Pharaoh may kill me, but I'm not going to stand in front of God and say, I didn't do what you tell me to do. You know, I've told you before about the time when I was about to turn 16. I was about to get my driver's license. So my father took me out to celebrate the big event. So we're having dinner at his favorite restaurant. And, uh, and we're, he's telling me he's proud of me, and I'm grown up. And you can't believe where the time's gone. Now I'm going to be driving. I'll be going places where he won't be. I'll be making decisions. He won't be there to help me. And I will probably feel a lot of pressure from my friends, peer pressure, to make decisions that I know, Mike knows, that my father would not approve of. And I'm going to be caught in a quandary. And I'm going to be wondering, should I be more afraid of my friends or more afraid of my dad? And so my dad crossed his arms and leaned on the table and he said, boy, when you're in that moment, let me help you. <laughs> you better be more afraid of me. Cleared up everything for me. <laughs> right? Okay. Let me tell you, one of the things that now, now, now theology is always bouncing back and forth between the transcendence of God, that God is holy, He is other, we can't understand Him, can't get to Him, and the eminence of God. God is close, God, God is, Jesus is my friend. And, and you'll see, you see shirts like, Jesus is my homeboy, and, and foolishness like that. And I, it's okay if I sin because Jesus understands, and, you know, He's my friend, He hangs, you know. To, to the other side of he's going to hit me with a bolt of lightning if I mess up. You know, right now we're coming out of a, of a, of a time of, of hyper eminence and we're moving back to a time of transcendence and you'll see how the, how the worship songs change uh, and the books change to the holiness of God, the otherness of God, the bigness of God and we'll, and we'll have a season of that. We'll get tired of that and we'll go back to the eminence. We're always banging back and forth. So to hold these two in tension is, is, is a huge tension and problem for, for most theologians and for most of us. We err on one side uh, or, or, or the other. But for most of us, we have never had this overwhelming, awesome, in the, in the true sense of that word, not in the slang use of it, 
experience of worship where you experience the presence of God and you lose your breath and your knees buckle. To where when you leave that moment of worship, if the Lord told you to do it, you will do it or die trying. Why in the world do you think Paul was so brave? He wasn't going to tell Jesus later, I didn't do what you told me to do. I was afraid of Agrippa. Uh Uh-uh. More afraid of Jesus than I am Agrippa. Do you not know? Have you not heard? No, because we try to compare to God the things that we know. God is like, uh, and we try to use metaphors. Did you, did, did you see what Isaiah said? What are you going to compare him to, the idols? The things that you look in your life to bless you? The things that you look for in your life to give you meaning, to give you a name? You can compare those things. How silly. They're made in a smelter shop. A guy hammers out a form, coats it with gold, puts it up after he's welded it together, and then you got to go find the guy who can make the base so your God doesn't fall over. See, that doesn't make you roll over laughing. I mean, have you ever, well, have you ever been at home sitting there reading the paper and you hear this, boom, boom. And you look at your wife and go, what was that? She says, I don't know. I guess our God fell over. <laughs> Send the boys in there to go stand him back up, would you? <laughs> the prophets do this all the time. What kind of God do you serve? You go out in the woods, you find a piece of wood. You chop the piece of wood in half. Half of it you use for firewood. The other half you carve to a God. And you bow down and worship it. Except when you move, you have to go in there and get your God. Because if you leave, your God can't follow you. What kind of God is it that you have to carry around in the back of your trunk? How are you going to compare God to this? How are you going to compare God to those things in your life that are right now trying to make ultimate claim in your life? And you have to carry them around. What kind of God is that? So you are trapped in your own little Babylon. Carried off by the consequences of mistakes. You want to do differently. You want to be different. But every time you move, all you hear are the rattles of the chains of your slavery. And then you hear the promise. You're going to be free. Can God get me free? Yes. Will he get me free? Do you not know, have you not heard, our God is like a shepherd who carries his sheep in the fold of his garment, who knows who is nursing and who isn't, and he takes care of the little ones that are still nursing. Do you think it was any kind of just good preaching when Jesus looked at his followers and said, I am the good shepherd? No. He's reminding them of this passage. He's telling them, I am the good shepherd. My sheep know me. I know my sheep by name. I know who belongs to me. I carry them in the fold of my robe. I wrap them around my neck. I watch over them moment by moment, day by day. There's never a moment when you're out of his sight, out of his reach, or out of his heart. Can our God guess? Will he guess? Which brings us to the question of the day. Can we? 
You know, a lot of times we'll argue about whether or not we can trust God. Sometimes the question is, can God trust us? Can we? Short answer, no. Youth wear out and fall. Young men stumble and wear out. It's now the first Sunday in February. Do you even remember your New Year's resolutions? You've already given up. February is tough because February is the month we become cynical again. Right? January, we're going to hope. Things are going to be different. I'm going to be nicer. I'm going to be sweeter. February is where you realize I'm the same old guy. Nothing's going to change. The world is the same old place. Nothing's going to change. And we give up in February. It's what makes February so hard. Can you? No. Not my own strength. You read, the, you read the Bible. Jesus says, love your neighbor. And your first response is, Jesus obviously doesn't know my neighbor. <laughs> if he knew where I lived, he wouldn't give such a commandment. You hear from Jesus, if you're going to follow me, Every day, pick up your cross and come on. And we can't. How many promises have you made to Jesus? How many have you kept? That's why we don't ever think we'll get out of Babylon. But those who trust in the Lord, those who wait on the Lord, will renew their strength every day. I want to tell you the hard thing about this. Do you remember in Exodus when God gave the children manna? They were hungry, so God provided manna. You know the rules of manna? You could only get what you needed for the day. That was it. Okay? Now, I don't know about you, but I like to have manna in the freezer. Okay? I want God's mercy for today. I want a little mercy that I can put in the cabinet because just in case I run out early, I know where to go get it. Okay? You get the manna you need for the day. Some of you are going through some hard, hard things. You're facing doctor's treatments. You're facing a long road of trying to get your life back together. Uh, you're cleaning up after an addiction, and, and you don't think you'll ever get your life right. You'll have the strength you need for the day. That's it. You'll go to bed exhausted, wondering how you'll ever make it through tomorrow. And when you get up, you'll have the strength you need for the day. Step by step. Yes, those moments when we fly like eagles are incredible. There are those moments when the wind comes to your back and you feel like you can run forever. But for most of us, the most important promise is I'm going to be able to put one foot in front of the other. I'm going to be able to walk and not pass out. One foot in front of the other. I'll go to bed exhausted. I'll go to bed in tears, thanking God I made it through today, not knowing how I'll make it through tomorrow. And I'll get up and I'll put one foot in front of the other. Those who trust in the Lord, who wait on the Lord, renew their strength day by day, step by step. Can God? Yes. Will God? Yes. Can we? No. Will we? 
in his strength. Yes. Let's pray together. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Listen, there are some of you facing some hard stuff. I look around the congregation. I see some of you. I know your stories. I know your journeys. I know what you heard from the doctor this week. I know what's going on at home. <laughs> and I know you don't think you'll ever get out of Babylon. But this is a message about the greatness of God, a God who can. Have you not heard? Do you not know? That this is the creator of the universe. This is the one who brings kings up and brings them down. This is the one who will hold you like a lamb in his arms. Have you not heard? Do you not know? And now this morning, he wants to continue that process. For some of you, it's going to be as easy as becoming a member of Brentwood Baptist Church. Go out to the table, find next steps, get that process started. For others of you, this is going to be a life moment. This is the moment you're going to trust God to keep his promise in your life. Or are you going to start this relationship with him? And, and you're, looking in, you're looking up now going, I, I don't know what to do, Mike. I don't know how to do that. That's why our ministers are standing out next to a sign that says next steps. Just go and say, I want to continue the conversation that Mike started. I want to pick up where Mike left off. And they'll pick it up from there. I promise you. Do not leave this place not knowing that God can and will bring you out of whatever Babylon you're in. Lord Jesus, every life is now open before you, every heart. We pray now, whatever we do is exactly what you want. Will you stand with me as we sing? This love so Thank you for worshiping with us.